Wheeler. My name is Dr. Dershon Brown and I will be your moderator for today's town hall. Today we will hear from United Way's president and CEO, Dr. Darian Hudson, and then from Mr. Wheeler, who will give us an update on how to vote safely in 2020. The last 10 minutes of today's town hall are reserved for questions, so please leave your questions in the chat box if you're watching via Zoom and in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. Now I'd like to turn it over to United Way's president and CEO, Dr. Darian Hudson, to share a few words. Thank you, Dershawn, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our weekly virtual town hall. Um, I'm very proud of the topic uh, that we're going to be covering today. Uh, as you know, we strive to bring you the information and the resources that you need uh, during this pandemic and the time um, beyond. At United Way, we know that to build a strong and equitable community, everyone must have a voice at the table and a voice with their government. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on every aspect of our lives, and this year's primary and general election will see those impacts as well. That is why we have joined Vote Safe Michigan, a coalition of organizations and community leaders throughout the state who are dedicated to ensuring voters have access to secure mail and ballots and safe in-person voting. Now, there's no mistake uh, this week that we're talking about voting. Uh, this week, we honor two titans in the civil rights movement, Reverend C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis. Uh, while I never knew either one of them personally, they are definitely my definition of a hero. Uh, we celebrate 55 years of the March on Selma uh, that Congressman Lewis led uh, at a very young age. And it leaves me with the question of who is going to continue uh, to carry the, the mantle and who is going to make sure that everyone who is able to vote is exercising that right. Uh, and the question is being answered today. Uh, we are really fortunate uh, to have the chance to hear from Mr. Hester Wheeler, our Assistant Secretary of State, who is joining us to share information and updates about this year's primary and the general election. Before I hand it over to Mr. Wheeler, I wanted to share a little bit about him. He has served in a number of vital and prominent roles in our community. And before becoming Assistant Secretary of State, Mr. Wheeler served as a, the Assistant County Executive for Wayne County. He was also the Executive Director of the NAACP's Detroit branch for more than a decade. Mr. Wheeler has also served as the Chief Innovation Officer with Black Family Development and is the CEO of his own company, providing leadership, community engagement, and government affairs consulting. Uh, if you've met Mr. Wheeler before, you know that he knows no strangers, and I can't think of a better advocate uh, to have on our side to make sure that everyone who is able to vote is getting out and voting, um, who understands that the Secretary of State is here to help us and support us and be a bridge uh, between the community and our electorate. And so without further ado, I am very pleased to welcome Mr. Hester Wheeler, our Assistant Secretary of State, to speak with us today. Hester, thanks so much for being here. Dr. Hudson, thank you. Uh, I, and I like all of that previous uh, do. Uh, uh, you just go right, uh, right ahead with all that introduction. Let me say a couple quick things too, though. Uh, we are so very lucky. Every time I've heard you speak, every time I've felt your passion, it, my heart moves. Uh, we are so lucky to have you here leading the United Way for Southeastern Michigan. And I know that you taught school here and uh, just uh, interacting with Dr. Brown and now you, Dr. Hudson, Detroit, this is a double whammy. So I'm happy to be a part of this very important experience. And uh, thank you for acknowledging the contributions of both Reverend C.T. Vivian and uh, Congressman John Lewis. I had the great occasion to meet both of them more than once and actually take pictures with them. And had I not been more modest, I probably would have taken a bunch more pictures with right. both of them. Uh, but th the fact that we have a Voting Rights Act, which is exactly what you just said, the fact that we have the Voting Rights Act, in fact, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act of 1975, all of that is the work of Congressman John Lewis. Mm -hmm. There are many of us, uh, the two of you included, that are committed to their life and their legacy and keeping hope alive. So that's my life work. I come out of an experience 
uh, where my commitment is to go to my grave empty. We're going to stay in the fight. And when people ask how long we fight, there's only one answer. We fight until we win. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you so very much for inviting me. Um, we've got a new set of voting rights here in the state of Michigan. And I really want to articulate and highlight some of those uh, new voting rights and how we can take advantage of it. But let me say this also, we got a new environment. This is a, a George Floyd environment. Uh, and I know both of you, I know how bad you sisters are. So you understand this concept called Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. This is a Kairos moment. The murder of George Floyd has triggered this Kairos moment. And that spiritually, that when the right issue and the right person and divine intervention all converge, that's a Kairos moment. Rosa Parks was a Kairos moment. The Me Too movement was a Kairos moment. So there's energy in the street. Hundreds of cities, dozens of countries around the world have erupted into energy committed to truth and justice and righteousness. This is a Kairos moment. So many of us have to do more of what we do well to capture the energy of this Kairos moment. I believe the world will continue to change in some powerfully positive way, ways. So I did prepare a, a quick PowerPoint uh, and I wanna go through it. Uh, my assistant is gonna put that PowerPoint up so we can just take you through uh, this presentation. I've got several things I'd like to talk to you about, uh, specifically Michigan's new voting rights. Uh, as you know, voters gave us proposals two and proposals three. Darcel, can you put that PowerPoint up? If not, I'm gonna to continue to talk. But pro voters gave us both proposals two and proposals three in November of 2018. And that's especially significant because out of those particular proposals, uh, Michigan gets the move from worse to first. We've got some new voting rights. Uh, uh, and this is the year of the trifecta. Uh, and what that means is only once every 20 years do you get uh, uh, the census, which leads to redistricting, and you get to elect a president. So civic engagement, civic awareness is typically much higher in a year like this than it would normally be. So that's why you feel a different kind of energy. And then you've got a different kind of person in the, the White House that's contributing to the energy many of us feel. So uh, while COVID-19 is in fact a pandemic uh, that requires a, a, a state of emergency, uh, we all agree that poverty is a pandemic and we need to declare a state of emergency. Racism is a pandemic uh, and we need to declare a state of emergency. But voting is the great equalizer. Voting is a great equalizer. That's the one day of the year or uh, two days out of the year where everybody's power is equal. So uh, redistricting allows for us to appoint 13 new commissioners to draw different lines. And Dr. Hudson and Dr. Brown, we need you guys to just increase your vigilance around this redistricting commission because you too as ordinary citizens have the opportunity to help shape what those lines should look like. I know you've heard the concept uh, gerrymandering, you know, with these squiggly lines, they go through, they ch chop up uh, communities. They diminish voting power as much as they connect uh, communities of, of color. Uh, so it's very important that you pay attention to this redistricting experience. And in fact, go to some of these hearings. You personally, as an average citizen, have every right to draw your own lines based on what you think is fair and make those recommendations to the commission. That's huge. That's huge. And it only happens once every 20 years. So we want you to take advantage of that. Proposal three is really the cat's meow. Uh, proposal three allows for uh, several things. Number one, no excuse absentee voting. No excuse absentee voting. Now, some of you might remember when we used to have to make excuses or make up different stories as to why we needed an absentee uh, ballot. Now you don't have to lie or you don't have to stretch the truth. You can just say, I wanna vote via the absentee process. And that's especially significant in this COVID-19 environment. That's especially significant. So uh, many of the concerns, and there are many legitimate concerns as to why people uh, might not want to go to the polls. We see that Michigan is trending in the wrong direction. We almost had a handle on it, but we're trending in the, in the wrong direction. So a lot of people are uncomfortable thinking about going to the polls. In fact, uh, we've got a poll worker challenge here in the city of Detroit and all across the state. We need you to uh, amplify th uh, that particular fact. We need you to add your voices to this new reality uh, that if you know people who are willing and able and interested to be a part of the civic solution, 
please call your local city clerk, particularly here in the city of Detroit, because I think we can use almost as many poll workers as might volunteer because you might know that very often poll workers are like senior citizens and, and because of compromised immune systems and because of real health challenges, they might not need to be the ones working on the polls. Uh, but I can assure you that we've got a ton of PPE equipment, the face masks, the gloves, the hand sanitizers, uh, the glass separation, all of that will be adhered to. People will be very comfortable. The social distancing requirements, uh, the six feet uh, 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 separation, we are encouraging people to take advantage of every social distancing requirement, every uh, sanitizing experience humanly possible so that you can in fact be comfortable. But more importantly, we want you to vote by mail. Absentee, no excuse absentee voting allows you to vote by mail. It allows you to vote from the comfort of your own home. Colorado and Oregon, for example, are two states that have had vote by mail vote at home uh, for nearly 20 years. And guess what? 65 to 75 percent of the voters participate via the vote by mail. So it's a paradigm shift uh, that's required here in Michigan. But we do encourage people, particularly because of this COVID-19 moment, to take advantage of the new voting right which allows you to vote by mail and vote via the absentee process. The, the, the next new voting right is same day voter registration. Uh, that's huge, same day voter registration. You used to have to be registered 30 days in advance. You guys remember that, but now you can wait until the very last moment, 745, 755, even as late as 759 and 8 p.m. if the clerk will have you, you can register and vote on election day. That is huge. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why it's huge. I know like uh, the two of you, uh, I believe the very best way to predict the future is to create it. That means young people, whatever we do, if it does not connect to young people, uh, it's almost irrelevant or definitely means sudden, sudden death. As soon as you die off, whatever you care about goes away. So the reason I mention young people in particular, though, because we will be home to four elections here in Michigan this year. Uh, you know, we had the March 10 presidential primary. We had May 5 elections in about 50 plus communities, mostly school military, school board related issues in smaller communities, nothing in Detroit. Uh, but we've got August 4 coming up, which is what we're focused on. And we've got November 3, which is the big one. That's the presidential. The reason that's uh, is the, the reason I mentioned those two previous elections is on March 10, during the presidential primary, we had nearly 14,000 people register and vote on the same day. Why is that significant? It's because over half of those 14,000 people who registered and voted on the same day here in Michigan were all under the age of 30. Now, why is that significant? It's because hundreds of those young people under the age of 30 were ages 18 and 19. So what I am saying is that Young people do want to participate. They do want to be a part of the solution, but very often they wait until the very last moment to get involved. So don't give up on young people. Keep pushing them, keep reminding them, keep doing what you do to get them to the poll because they do in fact want to participate. Uh, so that's March 10. May 5 taught us, we, there were some lessons learned from the May 5 election. Because of COVID-19, 98, nearly 99% of the people who voted around this state, they voted by mail. They took advantage of the absentee process. So I am saying if we keep encouraging people, keep educating, keep pushing, keep pushing, you will see uh, significant, significant increases uh, uh, to avoid the COVID-19 affliction where people will vote from the comfort of their home and they'll take advantage of Michigan's new voting rights. A uh, couple, three other things, and you, uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Brown, you'll wave your hand and let me know we're at the one or two minute um, uh, warning mark. But because of COVID-19, we've implemented a few other things. We've got something called the, the MVP, which is um, most valuable player. We're encouraging people to sign up, volunteer to work on the poll. People who are able-bodied, able people who are interested, people who have a high level of civic uh, engagement commitment, we're asking you to sign up with your local clerk. So go to the most important website that I can give you today is michigan.gov forward slash vote. michigan.gov forward slash vote. That's the Secretary of State's website. I promise you, if you spend three minutes on michigan.gov forward slash vote, 
you're going to be a very, very informed uh, citizen. We have the baddest website in all of Michigan. And don't tell the governor's people that I said that, but we have really loaded it with very, very helpful information. But the MVP program, the MVP program is designed to uh, encourage people to work on the poll as volunteers. And in fact, you get paid. The last program I will highlight is, uh, it's called uh, Voting Matters. In the spirit of Black Lives Matter, we put an initiative together called Voting Matters. So it's our Voting Matters initiative. We've identified 13 communities across the state of Michigan, which is home to the 100 lowest performing precincts in the state of Michigan. And we've been doing work in all of those communities to find out what it takes to get those low performing voting precincts engaged. The number one thing we've learned over and over and over again is people, uh, returning citizens don't know that their right to vote is automatically restored here in Michigan. And we've taken another step because of Jocelyn Benson's leadership. We've actually formalized a relationship with the Department of Corrections where all 9,000 uh, returning citizens will automatically leave those facilities with a driver's license, a, a state identification, a voter registration card, and a birth certificate. So that's the work that we're doing because we've got some innovative leadership. Let me stop accommodate questions. I know um, I've got three or four things I could say, but I want to answer questions and I can probably get there. Dr. Brown? Yeah, thank you so much, Hester. Um, thank you. That you mentioned that they're same day voting. That is so critical, especially with the uh, climate that we're in today with COVID-19. It may just slip your mind. You may say, oh my goodness, I didn't register to vote. That's right. You can do it on the same day is so, so important. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you. And jump right into the Q and A. Um, again, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat box or in the comment section on Facebook. Our first question comes from Ohio. Uh, they're indicating that they're so unfamiliar with Michigan. Will you all mail out ballots, or do people need to apply to get one? Yes. Uh, well, the fact is, we did mail 4.7 million absentee ballot applications. And if you fill out that absentee ballot application, you will in fact get a absentee ballot via the mail. You can go to, look at you, Dr. Hudson. She already has hers. Um, and, and if you go to michigan.gov forward slash vote, you can register, uh, you can request to be on the permanent absentee ballot list and you'll get a ballot for both the August 4 primary and the November 3, but you do have to make application for it. It's not automatic. Great, thank you. Thank you. Another question is, is there a website for Voters Matter? Yeah, it, all, all of that is on michigan.gov forward slash vote. I promise you, uh, just keep pointing and clicking until you get there. Uh, 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 and all of the information that I've shared with you is online. Uh, so whatever I've said, you can substantiate it on our website. It, it is definitely there. Okay, great. Uh, where do we find the 13 communities that we're focusing on? Uh, yeah, that is uh, when you get to our website and you ask for the uh, Voting Matters Initiative, and I can just tell you uh, from the top of my head, those cities include Detroit, for example, has nearly 40 of those low performing precincts. Flint has about 17. Sturgis, Battle Creek, Benton Harbor, uh, Buena Vista Township is uh, Saginaw, Ann Arbor has uh, two or three of those precincts. Ypsilanti, you would be surprised. Some of our premium cities, uh, we all have communities that for different reasons, you have one or two uh, uh, precincts that are very, very low performing precincts. And there, there's some commonalities uh, very often. Uh, well, sometimes it's a, a migrant community where uh, you have migrant workers or you have uh, English uh, people that speak different languages uh, or you have uh, low educational attainment or, uh, or, or, or some other critical, and there's somebody talked about, uh, uh, I forget the acronym, Bishop uh, Hurley Coleman out in Saginaw. He was telling us, you got people who, who are committed to the same thing, but they're, they're low income and they're just getting by and voting is not a, a priority unless we put extra emphasis on it. Absolutely. Uh, another question, is there other insight for low performing voter turnout? 
Yeah, in addition to the concerns that uh, low performing precincts have about returning citizens, very often uh, they just don't know what they don't know. Very often, uh, the, one of the number one, I was at the NAACP for a lot of years, and I know many of you have been active on a ton of uh, uh, voter mobilization initiatives. The number one call we get is, where is my polling place? Where do I go to vote? Uh, and a lot of people think that maybe because they've moved or maybe because they've lost their driver's license uh, that they don't have the right to vote. So we have to say the same things over and over and over again to remind people uh, that your right to vote has never been revoked. In fact, I need to tell you that every time you visit the Secretary of State's office for any reason, we will automatically update your voter registration. So just know that unless you say you don't want it. Uh, so location of polling places usually, uh, an issue. Uh, there are a few other little logistical challenges that we have to be conscious of. Uh, we fought for years to make sure that uh, there was no polling place inside of a police station, largely because sometimes there's a, as we see around the world, there's a little bit of tension between uh, police and the people. Uh, but we do have one in the city of Detroit, that's Seven Mile and Woodward. That's the only one we would allow for. Uh, so there are little obstacles. If a person has to go to a, a, a police station to vote, and maybe they got a little, little something, something else going on in their world. They say, no, I'm not going to have that experience. So, and then you've got people who mislead. Uh, we've got evidence over the years where uh, some of the mean-spirited conservatives or people from the outside, uh, they will typically send messages via social media saying, don't forget to vote next Wednesday, uh, November the 4th, when in fact election day is Tuesday, November 3. You follow me? or people send crazy messages. They think that they owe child support or if they've got some legal uh, challenge that they don't have a right to vote. So educate, 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 Dr. Brown, Dr. Hudson. Uh, can a felon vote? Say it again. A felon vote? Yes, yes. Uh, as long as you're not physically serving time on the day of the election, your right to vote in Michigan is automatically restored. And that's a big question. You can, be a, uh, you can be a convicted felon. It, it does not matter as long you could be waiting for your court date. As long as you're not physically serving time on election, election day, your right to vote is intact. And as soon as you've completed your time, you've been released from one of those uh, uh, correctional facilities, your right to vote is automatically restored. You cannot say that enough. That's an absolute fact. That's a law. That is great news. I know that was a big concern for uh, many individuals, and you mentioned the returning citizens. Yes. That they're released with all of those resources that you mentioned as well. It's huge too, Dr. Brown. 25 years ago, very few of us knew anybody that was in prison. Today, because of uh, the disparities in the criminalization experience, uh, nearly 50% of us are related to somebody uh, that has been incarcerated because of of, of racism and, and, and the George Floyd reality that we all live. So I think we have to prioritize the need for expungement fairs and the need for uh, 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 awareness amongst ex-offenders. So thank you for that question. Absolutely. Uh, another question, they said that they're from Ohio, but they teach in Michigan at Madonna University. Two okay. focus on social justice and community action and voting and voting suppression. In each class, I like for students to get involved in a community project. Who would you suggest that I contact to help with voting? Yeah, there are a ton of issues. Obviously, uh, the NAACP, the ACLU, the League of Women Voters, uh, if you happen to be one of them bad sisters in the Deltas or uh, the AKAs and uh, the Kappas and the Alphas, all of them are always doing good stuff. They get it. There are a ton of initiatives out there. If you don't, if you can't find one and you're active in a church or any kind of neighborhood black club, something as simple as walking door to door has huge impact. Uh, uh, encourage young people, particularly uh, to become precinct delegates. There are 19 things you can do without much thought. Uh, and if you can't find something, start something. Yes, absolutely. There have been media reports about issues regarding blind voters. Have those yeah. Wait, uh, say, ask that question one more time, Dr. Brown. You visit your reports about issues regarding blind. Yes. Have those issues been resolved? Yeah, in fact, they're going to continue. We uh, were on a, a call just uh, two days ago with uh, members of the disability community, 
And I'm embarrassed to tell you, I'd never heard the expression ableism. Have you guys heard that word before? Help me, help a brother out. I'm, I'm from Linwood, but we're committed to ableism. Uh, <laughs> um, and we've made a ton of provisions. Yes, we do have, make a ballot available for uh, uh, members of our blind community. And, and, and if you're blind, uh, you can bring a person to the poll with you that can assist you to go through that particular uh, ballot experience. So the answer to your question is yes, we're not uh, totally where we need to be. We've got to make sure that every polling place is ADA compliant. That means wheelchair ramps and that you have a special uh, uh, polling booth that accommodates a, a, a wheelchair person uh, and, and, and that people are treated fairly and, and they have fair access. You, you can't treat people different. I don't care what your situation, you can wear a hijab, or you can be uh, illiterate, you've got to treat people fairly and make sure their right to vote is respected. And that's our highest commitment. You've got the right people and at the right time uh, managing this process. So as, as your Secretary of State, in addition to all things driver's license and traffic related stuff, we're also the Chief Elections Officer and we take that responsibility very, very seriously. There are some 1600 plus clerks across the state of Michigan. We've got training videos on our website our job is to provide administrative support to, to those various clerks, and we want everybody to get it right. Awesome, thank you. Um, you mentioned the polling places. Two questions came in. One regarding the PPE and safety of being able to vote in person. The second question is, are there enough poll workers? How do you, and how do you volunteer if you don't have enough poll workers? Yeah, uh, the very best relationship we could all have between now and election day is with your local clerk. I am always uh, uneasy about the, the number of poll workers. I would rather have too many than not enough. Uh, we don't want any, we can't close any polls. We can't change any locations on the way to election day. We can't clean up voter lists. So uh, I would, I know that the city clerk in Detroit, the city clerk in Canton, the city clerk in Rochester Hills, they're all uh, reaching out to encourage people to, uh, make application. Poll workers do get paid. I don't know the exact uh, fee, but it's somewhere between 125, maybe as much as 250 dollars for one day of service. So please contact your local clerk. We need you, and uh, we will provide you with PPE and safety equipment. Uh, and we also are making grants available to local clerks uh, so that if you need additional tabulators or if you need additional uh, safety equipment, we'll meet you halfway. Uh, so there are some resources, there are some commitments to make sure these polls are ready and we need as many workers as is humanly possible, especially young people. And you can work on a poll as early as age 16 and 17. So can I say one thing about young people? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Hudson, um, another real significant thing we've learned is that um, uh, people who exercise their right to vote at their very first or second opportunity typically become voters for life. If, if you miss that 18 year old and their first opportunity or their second opportunity, then it's people like Dr. Hudson, Dr. Brown, Hester Wheeler, people like us, we spend the rest of our life chasing that voter. So that's why it's so important to connect uh, that high school graduation uh, diploma with that voter registration card. Let's go after these young people. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Hudson now. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Please give uh, everybody we know in common my best regards. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, thank you, uh, Dershon. This has just been a real treat uh, to listen to you. And I hope, I know we're, we're all smiling, we're enthusiastic, but I hope people really understand just how serious this is. I did hold this up. This is my absent voter ballot. It comes in the mail. You see this little swipe, this, list, this little insignia here. It says official election mail. The application comes, you will see this. When the ballot comes, you will see this. And I can't stress it enough to everyone who is listening. Please get the word out. When you get yours, take a picture, tweet it, Instagram, Facebook, any, I don't know, TikTok, all that other stuff that people do. 
please, please, please take the time to do that. Uh, the charge is, is, is here as I'm listening to you. You need poll workers. We can organize volunteers for you. I saw Pastor Overman is with us today. Uh, yes, uh, from Inkster. And so I know she's going to help us uh, get the word out. And so uh, I just appreciate you being here. Um, this is a special year. I graduated in 1996 from high school. And so I participated in the 96 presidential election. You're right. It, it, it is so important. There is a, an extra burden that is on us when you turn 18 in an election year, but you have to do it. You've got to make sure you make that commitment uh, to vote. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, as you all know that you've been, you've been tuning in, uh, listening to us, we've covered everything from unemployment uh, to being able to assist people with getting access, uh, getting their water, getting their utilities uh, turned back on. We've talked about childcare. Uh, we've covered a number of different issues. We are going to continue to make sure that we're bringing this information to all of you as you were listening. We also hope that you will continue to do all of the things we need you to do in 2020. Vote and also complete your census. If you have not done that yet, please, please go to BeCountedMI2020.com. It is not too late. There's going to be a big push next month. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are at the front of that line uh, getting that census completed. It's only nine questions. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes. So please, please take the time uh, to do that. Also, if you are in need of help and you're listening to this, you can still call 211. That is our 24 hour, seven day a week service uh, that is just for you. You can call with any questions you have, uh, whether it's about rental assistance, whether you're trying to find uh, diapers, whether you're trying to find any resources, um, all of this is available to you. Uh, you can go online also to unitedwaysem.org slash 211 um, and you can also just call literally those three digits 211 to be able to get the help uh, that you need. So our next town hall is actually scheduled for next Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. Uh, we are going to be talking about after school programs and out of school programming for our young people. Uh, we're pleased to welcome the team from um, the YDRC, uh, which is the Detroit Youth Development Resource Center. Sarah Placha Elliott, uh, the executive director, will be talking about Discover Your Spark and uh, focusing on a number of our out of school programs for youth. Uh, this is mission critical now as we are all reimagining uh, the learning environment for our young people. So we hope that you will join us. Uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Cassie, you can go to uh, the next slide. Uh, the last charge that we have, and we know we've waited on you thick today, uh, but we do want you to call Congress, tell your, your, your local lawmakers to support our families with a COVID-19 relief bill. You can do that by going to standwithunitedway.org and let your voices be heard. Make sure the sacrifices of our titans who we have lost uh, this week, they weren't in vain. We are going to continue to do this work. We're going to continue to be vocal. We're going to continue to advocate uh, and make sure that the next generation can look back and say with, with pride that others sacrificed for them the way that we talk about Representative Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. So with that, thank you so much uh, for being here. Mr. Wheeler, again, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time.